good evening, everyone, and thank you for all. Um, thank you all for coming out, and to those who are um, streaming via YouTube, we appreciate your participation as well. Nice party. Four hundred six. I'm sorry. Four hundred and sixty-three thousand. Four hundred and sixty-three thousand is the average number of people aged twelve and older that experience sexual assault each year in the United States. Every ninety-eight seconds, another person is sexually assaulted. But according to the National Sexual Violence Research Resource Center, only twenty-eight percent of those survivors were reported to the police. Of those cases, only six in every one thousand perpetrator spends time in jail. This is why it's so important to understand what sexual assault looks like. Women in, women in schools are three times more likely to be sexually assaulted than women out of school. Before the graduation day, one in five women and one in 16 men will be sexually assaulted. The prevalence of sexual assault on college camp campuses is st staggering, and chances are if you're not personally affected, you'll know someone who is. The problem we face being in college when it comes to sexual assault are huge, and the fact is we are drowning in it. Our goal is to make sure that people can walk on this campus without the looming fear of being sexually assaulted. Today, we want to give everyone more insight on how sexual assault can be stopped by letting you know about resources that we have. We have representatives from different organizations and departments on campus here to speak to you about how to um, combat sexual assault. Let's give our panelists a round of applause before they introduce themselves. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, okay. Hi, my name is Mia Macaluso. Um, I'm the secretary and social media manager for Tigers Against Sexual Assault on LSU's campus. And I have been an original member of TASA since obviously the beginning and have been on the e-board since then. And yeah, I'm just really passionate about trying to end sexual assault on campus and educating my fellow college peers. Good afternoon, <coughs> my name is Bart Thompson. I'm the police chief at LSU Police Department. I've been at LSU for 11 years. Uh, I've had over 40 years of experience at law enforcement coming from Baton Rouge Police Department. Good evening, everybody. My name is Joshua Jones. I'm the LSU Title IX coordinator uh, for LSU. I started back in uh, late August. Um, uh, before that, I was at the University of Kansas. And before that, uh, I was a prosecutor in Miami, Florida, where I spent a, a, a chunk of time um, as a prosecuting sex crimes for, for the uh, Miami-Dade County. Um, the Office of Civil Rights does house the, the Title IX office. We're kind of one in the same, uh, just two sides. And then we have two sides to the Title IX office. One is what I'll call our response side. So that's the side that maybe a lot of people are thinking of recently. So uh, if students are affected by sexual violence, sexual harassment, power-based violence, we receive those reports. Um, but we also have a, a kind of a new prevention side. We have our very first Deputy Title IX Coordinator for prevention education. And so we're currently working up building up that prevention side of, of the work that we're doing. Thank you for being here. Hi everybody, my name is Emma Durstein and I'm a resource advocate with STAR, which stands for Sexual Trauma Awareness and Response. We are a local nonprofit that serves survivors of sexual trauma and their loved ones and we provide free and confidential services. Our services are divided into three main groups. We have advocacy, counseling, and legal. Our advocacy team is pretty much the heart of our services. We run our 24-7 hotline, and we also provide 24-7 hospital accompaniment to survivors who are getting forensic medical exams. We provide case management, making sure that survivors have all of their basic needs met, that they're physically and emotionally safe, and that they have all the accurate information to make informed decisions that are best for them. And our counseling team provides both individual and group counseling to survivors of sexual trauma and their loved ones. And lastly, we have our legal team made up of staff attorneys who can represent survivors in court proceedings, help them get protective orders, help them break their leases, things of that nature. Hello, everyone. My name is Victoria Polk. I am one of the Lighthouse coordinators um, housed in the Student Health Center. It's the, the Lighthouse program. Tell you a little bit about what we do there. Um, 
We are a confidential free resource, so you will not see a cost for visiting with the Lighthouse program and receiving their services. We assist student survivors who are impacted by interpersonal violence that might look like dating violence, um, harassment, stalking, assaults of any kind that be physical, sexual. Um, we offer a space for healing, get you supported, um, connect you to resources both in the community and on LSU's campus, um, and advocate for you both on in the larger part of the community or on LSU's campus. Um, we are housed in the Student Health Center on the ground floor, um, otherwise known as the basement, but I like the ground floor because it sounds nicer. Um, but you are welcome to join us. It is confidential, like I said, so no one will know that you're there but myself and you. Thank you. So now we're gonna step into our scripted questions that we prepare for each panelist. Tasa, do you believe that students are aware of your program? Um, I definitely think we have like a pretty strong presence in terms of like student run organizations on campus, maybe not as much as like the average Greek, you know, organization, but we have, I mean, we have over a thousand followers on Instagram. Most of them are students and professors and other student organizations. And the protests and events we've done, we've had pretty good turnout. So I would say we're known by a good chunk of the student body. Okay, your second question would be, what steps do you see your school administration taking to prevent sexual assault? What are changes you would like to see LSU make regarding sexual assault? Ooh, okay. Um, firstly, I would fire any professor who is caught violating their mandatory reporter terms. So when they're a mandatory reporter, obviously they have a duty to the Title IX office to report any student that discloses um, an act of sexual violence to them, whether they are the survivor or the assaulter. And obviously that has not been happening on LSU's campus um, with many people. So that would be my first act, would be to fire those people. My second act would be to probably, hmm, I would say go into Greek life and do comprehensive sexual violence prevention trainings, I think that's a big part of it too. Sports teams as well. Um, I know a lot of people who have said that Greek life and just the culture around it make it more dangerous on campus and I have to agree with that because obviously the evidence is there. So I would say training for those people. If you work at LSU as a student worker, you have to get sexual assault training anyway. So I would say that the same training or something similar to our hazing training that we have to do every year would be a good thing. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Chief Thompson, your question, your first question is gonna be, do you feel as though students have all the necessary resources to feel safe on campus to um, report any sexual um, assault or misconduct? You know, LSU is, you know, a city within itself. Uh, we're not immune to crime. Uh, obviously, crime is uh, on a hype in this parish. Uh, so we look at that very seriously. Uh, we know as the police department, we can always do better. LSU can always do better, and the community, community can always do better, our university committee. Uh, we have several different resources out there. We have a uh, outreach division uh, and Kim Bass and Marlon Hawkins, what they do is they go down with different groups, sororities, fraternities, uh, student government, and have that conversation, not Officer Bass, but to Kim and to her dog, Jazz. Uh, have that conversation on what they feel and what we can do to help them feel better. Uh, we have the LSU Shield. Uh, LSU Shield is a free app. I, I hope everybody has it on their phone. Uh, but it gives you so many different outlooks to, to get help. Uh, anonymous texting, you can take a picture, you can uh, indicate where you're at. If you call the push the help button on LSU Shield, 
it will tell LSU police what building you're at, what floor you're at, and what room you're at. So that's huge. Uh, we have several courses, uh, equalizer course, the RAD, the course, rape aggressive uh, defense. Uh, so there's a lot of resources out there. But as long as we continue to have sexual assaults, there's always room for improvement, and that's what we look at. Uh, the university started, Dr. Tate started a uh, committee of, of safety and security committee, uh, which is made up of LSU students, uh, staff, uh, different organizations, and they come, in fact, we have a meeting next week, they come and talk about safety on our campus. Because we look at, you know, police can be in a silo. Uh, we think everything's good because we're in our little silo. Uh, so this gives us an opportunity to reach out to different departments and different organizations and let them tell us how they feel. Uh, you know, we're hearing a lot of, uh, especially from females, I feel unsafe. Well, I need to know what that is, and it's hard to fix something if I don't know what that is. And I think they're not aware of that. They know they have that gut feeling, and it's hard to, to get that information out. So we hope those committees and those organizations, outreach can help uh, come together and provide a safer place on campus. Okay. Your second question, um, you kind of spoke about steps you um, were taking, as the department was taking in order to um, accommodate sexual um, assault survivors and stuff. So the second question, what, what other steps, like can you, can you um, highlight some of those steps that the LSU Police Department has taken to prevent and sexual assault and also to once um, sexual assault has happened to make the, the survivor feel? To prevent, uh, obviously know your surroundings. Uh, you know, you have an, uh, an accuser that may be known to you, or you may have an accuser that doesn't know you. Uh, so those are addressed two different ways, and the prevention two different ways. Uh, if, if you are approached by someone you know, and you happen to be at a bar uh, when Tiger Land gets their bridge back, uh, be conscious on, on what you're doing. Uh, don't take drinks that are not un that are unopened. Uh, look who's around you. You usually end up going there with a friend or with a uh, co-student. Well, if that friend has been drinking too much, then you go. You take them home. You get them home. Uh, you know, when we talk, we talk about the Marines. Don't leave people behind. Uh, so, especially the sororities, we preach that. You know, and to be in a, you know, a sister in the sorority means not just Monday through Friday. It means after hours, too. Uh, so we have to look out for each other because sometimes we're not looking after each other. Uh, aggressor, uh, someone that you don't know, uh, if you're involved in a sexual assault, we encourage you to make a report, to contact the police. It doesn't mean you have to prosecute or doesn't mean you have to press charges but it's real important that you make that report. It helps us on the prosecution side if in fact you choose later uh, to press charges. It allows us to get evidence, it allows us to do a lot of things, but it is at the bottom line, it's your choice. And we expect that. Uh, we do not want that answer on the day or the night of a tra traumatic event. Uh, you're not in the position to answer that. Uh, but it allows us to get that information because that information may lead us to that accuser already doing something. So it's real important that if you feel comfortable with police to go ahead and make a report. Like I said, doesn't mean they have to go to jail because we do have times that uh, a victim or survivor is involved in a sexual assault with someone they know and they do not want another tragic event of having to testify and put them behind bars. That again, that is up to you, but it's real important to get that report. It's hard to get help when you don't come forward. So that's again where bystander intervention has. Uh, you know, we had a case, in fact, we met with Title IX in, uh, in Lighthouse last week. We constantly are talking and sharing information and looking for different uh, avenues how we can help. Uh, but we had a case where uh, this person felt unsecure and uh, and threatened to take their life. And uh, we were able to get them information and talk to them. And through talking to them, she felt that she would talk to us and actually uh, gave us information that she was sexually assaulted. 
police are not the bad guys. Uh, do we do bad things? Are there bad policemen? Yes, but we're not the bad guys. Uh, we're here to help, and, and I think that's, if we can break that wall between the two, I think it would help. Thank you, Chief. Dr. Jones, your first question is going to be, what are, what are action, what actions are required by Title IX concerning universities after a report has been made? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. So um, first I just wanna say, so right, uh, almost every LSU employee, with the exception of uh, folks in like our Lighthouse program, uh, our, mental, our uh, student health center, right, our doctors, our mental health counselors, right, those, those confidential resources. And then we do have 26 confidential um, uh, uh, um, advisors, gosh, I was blanking on the word, right? So those folks are confidential, but everyone else is a mandatory reporter. So if it is disclosed outside of like a class assignment, like an event like this is excluded um, from mandatory reporting because we want people to be able to, to kind of speak up and share without um, but other than that, it's most cases it is going to have to be reported to our office. So one of the things I tell students, you know, to go along the lines of right termination of folks who don't make that mandatory report, it is now state law. That law went into effect last summer, um, so it is now state law that a, a report has to be made. So I think it's important that students and employees know uh, that when that mandatory report comes to our office, an email is going to go out from either our deputy Title IX coordinator for response and uh, resolution or our case manager. And that email is gonna go out to that survivor to talk about resources, to invite them in for options, uh, to help connect them to resources like Lighthouse or others. And if somebody doesn't receive that email, one of two things has happened. Either that employee didn't make the mandatory report or there was somehow a gap in our services and we didn't get the email out. And so it's just important that a student knows to expect that email and they don't have to respond to it. They can ignore the email. They can respond and say, I really don't want to talk to anybody yet. That's totally fine. But if they don't get that email, it's a sign that something in the process didn't go as it should. And we can check to make sure, A, we fix the process, or B, if it is an employee who was supposed to make a commander report, that would start that process. So again, so once we get that report, that email is going to go out to the student. We hope the student will, will take us up on the offer to come in and talk. But again, there's no pressure to do so. And maybe they're not ready in that moment, right? Maybe a week later, a day later, a month later, a year later, whatever it is, that's okay. Maybe the student says, you know, I'm not really interested in talking to you, but I, I, I'm gonna go talk to Lighthouse. Awesome, right? Um, because sometimes students wanna have that confidential conversation first before they talk to somebody in our office. One of the things that our office can do anytime a student meets with us is provide what are called supportive measures. And supportive measures are designed to keep a student connected to their academics, keep them connected to their co-curriculars, keep them connected to their job if they have an on-campus job. So that may look like a student coming and saying, um, you know, this happened this weekend, I didn't go to class for three days, I just couldn't bring myself to go to class. Um, and that's what we see of a lot. We actually see those, those disclosures to faculty because the student is going to the faculty member and say, hey, I'm a really good student, I know I've missed your class, that's really unlike me, here's why, right? Um, so we can work with the faculty member on uh, put something like excused absences, extensions on assignments. Um, you know, sometimes we might need to do, they say, you know, I, 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 the individual is in that class, can I switch to another section, whatever that looks like. So we can always provide those supportive measures without a formal complaint. And that's the, the kind of the second big point is that a report does not equal a formal complaint. So just as Chief Thompson said, right, that a report to, to law enforcement doesn't mean that there's gonna be, there has to be a full investigation, that it's gonna go to the DA's office. Same with our office. Um, in, in most cases, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm making up a statistic, but right, like 99% of all cases, the, the complainant or survivor is gonna have um, the, the option to decide what they wanna do next, right? Do they wanna file a formal complaint? If so, do they want an investigation? Do they wanna do an informal resolution? Do they just want supportive measures? Do they wanna go to Lighthouse? Those are all of their menu options and they get to choose. I say 99 because there, there could be that one case where if I feel there's a, a true danger to campus, let's say that I've seen this name pop up many times and I think we have a, like a predator or a serial rapist on campus, 
there could be an exception where I would file that formal complaint myself. Again, that student can still say, you do what you got to do, but I'm not talking to you. And that's okay. We're not going to force them to talk to us. But we are going to try to gather information because we feel there's that danger to campus. Um, they're never locked into anything, too. I, I used to do a reference to, like, who wants to be a millionaire, and I don't think that's a thing anymore. But, but you're never locked into an answer either. So if a, a, a student comes in and says, I just want supportive measures, I'm struggling in this class, can you help? We can do that. They come back uh, a month later and say, I'm considering filing a formal complaint. Can you talk me through? Um, maybe in that meeting they say, okay, I want to think about it. I want to talk to my family and friends. Then they come back two months later and say, I'm ready. I'd like to file that formal complaint. Perfect. We can start that process with them. And, and vice versa, they can start the formal complaint process, and if they decide they don't want to continue the process, they can always withdraw the, their formal complaint. Um, if they decide they want investigation, we can switch to an informal resolution, right? So there's lots of options. One of the things that we talk a lot with Lighthouse and others about is these situations have caused somebody to, to kind of lose power or right, a choice was made that wasn't theirs. So we try to, in our process as much as we can, and Title IX does have some certain things that have to happen, but we really try to empower that student with a menu of options so that they can decide what they feel is in their best interest so nobody else is telling them, here's what's best for you. Okay, your second question is gonna be, since the office's creation over a year ago, what, can, what conditions have you seen improve on campus and what areas are Title IX pursuing moving forward? So I think a couple areas of improvement. So one is staffing. I mean, right, that you, if you've read the Hush Black Law Report, it's I think a couple hundred pages, so maybe you haven't read the whole thing, but, but one of the big things in, in Hush Blackwell was that the Title IX office is woefully understaffed. So I believe at the time that that report was written, there were two full-time staff members, and then I think there may have been some other folks on campus that, that worked uh, with the office. So we've gone from two folks, the Office of Civil Rights and Title IX now has, I believe, 11 staff members, with nine of those staff members directly doing um, Title IX work, and then we have two staff members that do ADA work uh, through our office. So that's the first thing, right? We've gone from two to nine, and we're expand, or yeah, two to nine for Title IX, and we're expanding. So we currently have a job posting out there for uh, a case manager, um, and then this summer we'll probably be looking at another investigator, a fifth, so we currently, there was one full-time investigator, now there's four, we're gonna look for probably a fifth investigator, and we'll probably be bringing in a second case manager who will help us with our civil rights side, so our bias complaints, but also be cross-trained in Title IX, so that if there's an influx of those types of reports, because there's kind of a cycle throughout the semester of when we get those reports in, they'll be cross-trained to do that. So that's the first thing that, that has improved a lot. I think the second um, is just the process. The process is more clear and defined internally to our office as to how things work. Um, I think along with that, the mandatory reporting process is more clear. I hope it's more clear that our employees find that they understand what their mandatory uh, uh, responsibility is. We're launching our sexual harassment training for employees next week. We had a little bit of issues getting into Moodle and getting it all set up, um, but it it's, uh, has two modules. It has three, but, but the first module is a 45-minute training from the Board of Regents around power-based violence and mandatory reporting. The second module is an LSU-specific module. So, right, you've learned about the overarching umbrella, but it's how to specifically make a complaint here. What, does, what do you need to do when, when a student discloses? Um, what are resources that you can help connect the student to? And then the third module, uh, the employee has to sign that they recognize. They have to, to kind of, I think it's a digital signature, but sign that they recognize that they are a mandatory reporter and they understand uh, what that, that means. So. Um, those have all been a lot of great improvements. Uh, second part, I think, was future improvements or future things that we can see progress on. Communication. So we have heard, it's, we're in the School of Journalism, we have heard consistently from students that they don't, aren't receiving communications from us, they don't really know what's going on. These types of forums are great, um, but they're not gonna reach every student, so we're really trying to figure out what does that communication plan look like. When the office was formed in March of 2021, um, I mean, it was very small, there was a lot of flux, and so at the time, a social media accounts weren't created for our office, so we're using kind of the main LSU social media accounts. 
and in talking with the folks that run our social media accounts through the university and our, our university relations folks, we've decided it's time for our office to have its own social media presence. So over the summer, I am going to learn a lot about social media and TikTok and Instagram and, and Twitter. And thankfully, I have staff that know it a little bit better than me. Um, and we're going to create our social media accounts. We're also looking at having peer, um, peer uh, educators that are just working for our office, educating students around prevention. So that's another area we're really building is it's all been about response. And there's been prevention. I don't want to take away from the prevention work that's doing because Lighthouse has been doing prevention work for years. Um, but they're a small staff, right? And so they've finally, they've expanded their staff as well. So you're going to see a lot more prevention focus happening on campus. Um, we're partnering with um, Lighthouse and uh, Student Health and athletics and diversity um, and there's another unit I think so over the summer we're going to be looking at uh, national bystander intervention programs and bringing one of those programs to campus most likely it'll be either bringing in the bystander or green dot mm -hmm. um, and we're going to really push that out to students faculty and staff because it's not just on students right to, to know how to intervene in bystander intervention situations I'm sure if I talk to students, they could come up with an example of a time they were in class and something was said or done that they felt the faculty member should have intervened on and didn't. And sometimes that's just because somebody doesn't know how to intervene. And so we want to bring those skills and that toolkit to all of our community. So that's a big push you're going to see next year is prevention and specifically around bystander intervention. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Jones. Okay, Ms. Dorsey. The two questions that we have for you are, the first one is going to be, what are some resource, re resources that SCAR has to offer to survivors on college campuses? Yeah, so of course all of our services are available to student survivors, but the services that I would highlight are um, if a survivor is in a Title IX proceeding, our staff attorneys can serve as advisors and also just help them navigate that process. Um, our advocates can accompany survivors to meetings that they have on campus regarding their sexual assault. We can accompany them to report to the police. And if a survivor lives off campus and their perpetrator knows where they live or they start to feel unsafe, we can help them break their lease. We can help them find alternative living situation and really any other case management issues that might come up for survivors on campus. The second question is going to be, in, in, your in, in your experience, are prevention efforts focused around women being extra vigilant or around discouraging, discouraging men from acting without um, consent? Yeah, so in regards to the way we as a society approach prevention of sexual trauma, I would definitely say that there's still an undue burden that we place on women to be hyper vigilant and to police what they wear, how much they drink, where they go, Etc. And we see that in the you know victim blaming rhetoric that we hear on a daily basis when people ask what were they wearing, how much did they have to drink, why didn't they fight back, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, when we know that real prevention comes from education and advocacy and having early conversations about consent and what consent looks like, um, safe dating, and healthy expressions of sexuality, navigating power imbalances bystander intervention, and then of course, believing survivors when they do come forward and holding perpetrators accountable, and also having conversations about the fact that not all survivors are women and not all perpetrators are men. Thank you. Ms. Polk, your two questions are gonna be, what is the most utilized resource by students that Lighthouse provides? Good question. So uh, first I wanna go over all of the services the Lighthouse program has to provide and then I'll kinda go into what I see the most. Um, so the Lighthouse program can assist in, as Josh was saying, supportive measures. So we can um, notify instructors that there was a traumatic event that took place. Um, we will not go into detail of what had happened in that event, but we will let them know that there was something and that um, between this time frame and this time frame, you are to give fl flexibility um, and consideration in, a, in academics for the student survivor. Um, that usually helps quite a lot because there's a lot of noise after a traumatic event. You're tra just in survival mode and you're having to deal with academics and your interpersonal relationships and having to, de to deal with the load of having something traumatic happen to you. 
Um, so we definitely want to be able to give you that support academically by um, informing your instructors should you like to proceed with that. Um, we also assist with submitting referrals to our mental health services. Um, those services are free of cost, of course, because we are a free confidential resource. Um, so you can be seen with our mental health services through Lighthouse program and then receive that emotional support um, following a traumatic event or a historical event. So it doesn't have to be something acutely um, in occurrence. It can be something that happened historically many years ago in childhood and you just have it resurfaced and want some support. Um, we also assist in rehousing. So if there's ever an event that took place on campus, you might be living in a dorm and you wanna move somewhere else, we connect you with residential life and see if there's anyone um, any dormitories that or apartments available for you to move and feel safer on campus. Um, we also connect you with legal advocacy should you want to break a lease off campus, and I know STAR also does that as well. Um, so that's an excellent resource if you don't feel safe at your off-campus um, residence. We also assist in um, sending referrals to medical clinic, free of cost, of course. So if there's ever any concern of an STI or an unplanned pregnancy, Perhaps you may have been injured after a domestic event um, and you want to have those things assessed and, and to see if there are any injuries there, we can send a referral to the mental health, excuse me, to the medical clinic and have them do that assessment and get that proper care for that injury, right? Um, so those are all the things that we kind of do in a nutshell. Um, I'm trying to think of this, if there's anything that I might be missing. Um, I think that's it. but. Essentially, what we see the most thus far are uh, supportive measures. So um, ac academically, it's just really overwhelming having to manage the assignments, um, going to class in person, having to navigate these spaces, especially if that event occurred on campus, having to walk past this area where that event took place, right? Um, so we do a lot of supportive measures so that student can to meet one-on-one -on -one with that instructor, discuss what your supportive measure will look like in that class. So that might be um, doing assignments retroactively. So reopening assignments, um, being able to complete those in a timely manner. Um, you might get some consideration for absences. So it's been really hard for you to get to class. Tell the instructor, hey, like I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm just in survival mode right now. Can you please give me some flexibility? Um, and then be able to get those absences taking off of your record essentially. Um, perhaps looking into some temporary academic accommodations. So um, if you just do not feel comfortable in private spaces, um, testing with a bunch of your fellow students might be distracting or overwhelming, might be triggering. Um, you can get temporary ac ac academic accommodations. Um, to be able to test in a private room or get a note taker so you don't have to be in person on campus, do it telehealth, depending on the structure of the course, of, cor of course. Um, so we do see a lot of supportive measures and we also see a lot of mental health service referrals um, because that the emotional support is desperately needed. Having um, students who might be out of state, their support systems are not housed in Louisiana, um, they might have friends here, but their family, the, the strongest support systems are not there. Um, and they might not feel comfortable disclosing to their family quite yet. So having the Lighthouse program being a confidential resource where you can confide um, in individuals who are understanding and who are meeting you where you're at and then submitting the referral to mental health services so they're on your side too, supporting you and um, giving you the trauma-informed response that's desperately needed. Um, we see a lot of students requesting that, um, and we're happy to provide, right? We're happy to support and, and make ourselves available and meet you guys where you're at and get you connected with different community resources, whether that be LSUPD for reporting, Title IX for formal reporting, or additional supportive measures with STAR for advocacy um, and prevention. There are a lot of resources available on campus, Lighthouse being one of them. Do not feel like you are alone and that you do not have options and you do not have support. Um, I think that totals that. <laughs> Sorry, I was getting emotional there. I'm just like, let me get off my soapbox. No, no, you're fine. The second question is going to be, um, what is one or a few things that Lighthouse wants to improve on and implement in the coming semester? 
Yes, so there's actually um, a project that the Lighthouse Program's working on. We want to make um, spaces specifically for student survivors. So we do host a lot of events that are open to the greater community and the LSU community, but we wanna be able to cultivate a community, a place of unity for student survivors specifically. And we haven't quite yet figured out how to um, make that happen because there's a lot of logistics to that you know student survivors may not want other people to know that they are a survivor of assault right um how do we formulate or f create a consent form so we can make sure that they um consent to having a space where other students might see them on campus and like oh yeah i remember you you were at this event and then that might be re-triggering um, and also, we would, we would also like to know what type of event, events that student survivors might actually want. I know that there's the trauma-informed yoga that's usually hosted by um, the wellness and health promotion staff housed in the Student Health Center. Um, but we kind of wanted to do something a little different, a little bit more creative, a lot more um, meditative and calming. And um, so we're actually looking for feedback. It's something that we're gonna be working on over the summer. Um, and we welcome anyone, whether you be a student survivor or you know someone who is a student survivor or you just have any suggestions, we are happy to hear your feedback um, because we really just want to have a space where student survivors feel welcomed and they're amongst people with similar experiences and um, can really feel like they can kind of talk about it, their experience and know that the person next to them knows exactly how it that was like because it's 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 a very distinct feeling and although I might be a very understanding and empathetic person we all have to admit as a student as someone not being a student survivor myself there's that disconnect right that I, I didn't live that experience I can support you and know that you went through this and I'm here for you for every step but right um, there will be that that person actually didn't experience this so like do they really know, right? So we want to be able to make those spaces for student survivors that they know the person next to them had had the, the, the same very feelings. Thank you, Ms. Polk. Now we want to open up the floor for any questions that the people in the audience or via YouTube have for our panelists. Okay, one question to start us off from somebody on YouTube is, Dr. Dr. Russo of the French department defended and excused actions of, a, of an abuser and continu continually allow him to access to students on campus despite reports and complaints of his actions. How as students can we protect ourselves in instances when we are required to be in classroom with excused abusers in power as our educators and those are those that excuse the, the abuse? And that's a question for um, that anybody on the panel can um, answer. Okay, well, I've been keeping up with this case and it's really just sad that, you know, like the students had to go through all of that just for their department head not to listen to them. And I really think that, like with new Title IX laws, like, if you're gonna report to a teacher, I think it would be good to report to more than one teacher. So if one of them decides to break the law and not be a mandatory reporter, like their report can still be turned in by another teacher. And as for being in a classroom with your abuser and or the teacher who did not report or excuse their abuse, I think LSU should do better to accommodate that person, either by making the class online for them or, you know, like the person I know of, like they're about to graduate, so they have to take this class. And their teacher is one of the ones who, you know, helped this predator not face any consequences here. So obviously they don't want to be in the classroom with the teacher. And, I mean, I think that's extremely valid. And I think LSU should, you know, just either make the class online for them or try to find a different professor to teach the class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
not familiar with the case also. Uh, of course, some of that is an administrative decision, but I want to just be able to bring out, uh, take that class out of the scenario, and let's say any class. If you're in a class and a professor or graduate student does something that makes you feel uncomfortable, walk out and let somebody know. See something, say something. You can go to LSU Police. If you're uncomfortable coming to the police, we'll come to you. You can reach out to the Lighthouse. Uh, just say something and don't hold it back. Uh, I can promise you something will be done on our end uh, to help you. Uh, I can't say something's going to be done on the administrative side. I can just say we're here to help you. You are our customers. Uh, Anytime you feel like you need to talk to somebody, uh, again, the community outreach, we will come to you. Uh, anytime you have a group, uh, organization similar to this, or even a smaller group, and you would like to, us to come speak, just pick up the phone. We, you know, Our motto is we want to be at anybody's table because we want to be able to give you our thought. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong, just giving you what we see here. Uh, you know, We're the one of the few divisions that's here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and uh, and we want you to use that resource. So I would just say I, I agree with, with everything Chief Thompson has said. In relation to, to, to that specific class, um, and I apologize, I don't know all the specifics, but I, I believe another section is opening up. So I know the department is working so that a student that doesn't feel safe in a class does not have to take that class. So. If any students have concerns about that, I encourage them to reach out to Dr. Stone, who's who's the uh, current chair of the department, uh, or I believe uh, Becky Kerr, um, who's uh, I believe an associate dean with HSS, or even reach out to our office, and we can we can connect the student to those who can help find them alternative classes so that they can graduate um, and not feel that they're in a class where they're unsafe. And in general, again, if students feel unsafe in a class or, or feel that something's happening. Um, those may be where, as Victoria was talking about, those supportive, those academic supportive measures, we're going to work with students so that, you know, Title IX was designed as, as a law to have access to education, so we want to make sure that students can have access to their education. Thank you. Anybody? Um, so this may have already been covered, so my apologies if it was, but are there any programs like currently being pushed like anywhere on LSU that are preaching like education on consent, like more of like an offensive strategy than a defensive strategy? And that could be for anyone. <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can start. So yes, um, it's, it's, I don't think it's scaled up very large yet, to, to be honest with you, but so our Deputy Title IX Coordinator for Prevention and Education and has a consent train. I know she partnered with maybe Lighthouse, um, but I know they went to talk to uh, a, a lot of the Greek systems a mm -hmm. um, couple weeks ago, a month ago. Um, so that's something we're going to be scaling up. I don't want to speak for them, but I also believe that TASA has been working with um, It's On Us, and I'll let them talk a little bit more about that program. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have a lot of events coming up in April. Um, you can find them all on our Instagram. The specific one that I think would be closest to what you're talking about, we're having like a picnic e event. Um, I believe it's on April 24th. It's called Coffee and Consent. We're having um, free coffee from Lighthouse Coffee, and we're just going to sit around and talk about like healthy consent practices and what makes a healthy relationship work. So sounds awesome. Thank yeah. you. And next, if I can put in a plug, next Thursday. Um, at the Women's Center, and I'm, I apologize, I've forgotten the time, but if you go to lsu.edu backslash SAAM, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, there's a um, queer and consent conversation to talk about what consent looks like in the queer community. Um, and so those are gonna be building up. We're also starting, I, th I mean, there's already some programming on healthy relationships, because I think that's another mm -hmm. really big key area is healthy relationships. So that's gonna be a partnership, I think, probably between our office, Lighthouse, mm -hmm. and the Student Health Center. Awesome, thank you guys so much. Good question. <laughs> and if you hadn't seen it, I brought some uh, copies of Tigers Are Committed, and it spells out a lot of things. Yeah. So as a faculty member, first of all, I'd like to say that the, the in the last year, I've 
had the occasion to make a couple of reports to your office, and I've, from my understanding, they've been handled really well and promptly, and and uh, and done been handled like they should. Um, I'm wondering though. Um, so faculty and other staff are, are in this. We're in the situation of being, you know, the mandatory reporters. So some, somebody says something to us, we report it. Um, but I wonder if there is a way, or if there are any, is there any thought to making to helping staff and faculty become more than just re reporters? It would seem like there are other roles that we can play. We should we should play. We've got students who are traumatized, mm -hmm. and I don't know that I have the. I mean, I know what I'm supposed to do if a student comes into my office and says, "Here's what happened to me." Because I've done that, mm -hmm. but I but I'm not sure that I and my colleagues are well trained and just what what other uh, s you know maybe services, but also just our our general attitude and and response to that student going forward. Yeah. Even though he or she is in is in your hand, good capable hands, what else can we do? Is are there thoughts about helping faculty just be just be better citizens around here in those kind of situations? There is so. Um, we, we touch on that, now let me say, so the, the LSU portion of the training is 15 minutes, right? So Board of Regents has 45. So you can imagine, the, we, we, are, we are surface level if we're talking about 15 minutes. But part of my, just take my intro video for it, and part of the training itself is going to introduce faculty and staff to the GRACE training, and I'm gonna turn that over to Victoria to talk about GRACE. Yes, so we have the GRACE training. We actually booked it for May 26th, it's gonna be telehealth um, from 11.30 to 1.30, so mark your calendars. Um, but it kind of goes over what it means to be a mandated reporter, what it looks like to uh, report examples of how you'd, reports that would be mandated to report, and then um, trauma-informed response. So we wanna be able to handle those reports very delicately whenever a student comes and discloses, because it takes a active courage and um, vulnerability. And so um, that is an excellent resource if you should you like to proceed with that. Um, just to learn, hone your skills for trauma-informed response um, and to get more familiar what type of reports you'd want to be reporting to Title IX and Lighthouse. Um, and so that's gonna be, again, May 26, 11.30 to 1.30 in telehealth. So it's real convenient. Um, and it's just basically a training open to LSU and greater community. And it's a great question because mandatory reporting, I mean, obviously it's the law, and it, we, we, we can see when, when that failure breaks down, right, how students are affected, but we also don't want our employees to kind of be robots. And I, and I, don't, I don't, you know, because some people, I think, I, I hesi I'm, I'm a little hesitant because I, I want to make sure the employees know, like, this is mandatory, and, and you can be fired for not doing it. Yeah. But I don't want employees to go into, I have to protect my job mode, versus there's a human being sitting in front of you who came to you for a reason because they trust you. So as long as, you know, by doing the right thing and supporting them, you've also protected your job, right? Mm -hmm. So I really want the emphasis to be on supporting the person in front of them and kind of the, but, but I get it. I mean, it was, it, there, you know, when, so last um, fall, our office went out and did these 15-minute mandatory reporting trains, right? Again, 15 minutes, we're not, but that's what units could kind of give us. And people were kind of scared, and I just, I wanna move employees from, I'm scared I'm gonna lose my job, to I have this, I've done the, the grace mm -hmm. training through Lighthouse, I know how to help a student, and by doing that, I'm, I'm, I'm securing my job, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. It can be kind of nerve-wracking to have a student come forward and say, hey, I was sexually assaulted, and these are the details of that, and then having to sit with the, those details, and that can be also traumatizing for yourself, and I think the training's excellent um, to give you the skills to just be able to sit calmly, um, because body language is one of, I mean, we, that's how we typically tend to communicate, so the student's gonna pick up on the way that you're taking this information, so being able to be calm and speak to them empathetically and having a soft voice and lowering your shoulders and making yourself inviting and welcoming, um, we're gonna touch on all of that in, in the training. And uh, we welcome you to, to join and then you could tell your, your faculty members, of course, that you work closely with so they can be there too. Yeah. 
So um, I know on other college campuses that blue lights are very effective, and I was just wondering, will LSU ever get them? Uh, that's a common question, and uh, we do meet. Uh, to answer your question, yes, they are looking at. Uh, we meet every month with the SEC Chiefs and Emergency Managers uh, on Zoom, and then we actually meet. They just left uh, coming back from the University of, uh, of uh, Arkansas, uh, and we look at their stats. And a lot of those that have uh, several li uh, blue lights, they don't have the call volume to justify. It's old technology. Uh, those were designed before phones were ever around. So what we don't want is someone that feels like they are in harm's way to stop and answer the f and pick up the phone. We want you to keep walking because you have a phone in your hand. And if the if the accuser grabs your phone, it's traceable, especially with light with uh, LSU Shield. Uh, so that's our big concern with the the shield because we I mean with the blue light we don't want you to stop uh, LSU had call boxes uh, before I came on I talked to some of the, the officers that were here back then during that time and they received no calls they got pizza orders at late at night and taxi calls but no calls so with that being said anything that y'all feel students feel that would make them feel safe then it's not us for us to block it I just want to make sure we're spending the right money for the right design. Mm -hmm. uh, just like lights, uh, we have a $4.4 million lighting project. And, uh, you know, I always say I want the outside to look like Tiger Stadium on a Saturday night, but you really don't. And they, I didn't know that. So looking at the professionals that come in and do lighting projects, you actually can have things to light. So if you have so much light in one area, that makes this area dark. So it's more than just turning on lights. So that, that survey's going on, we have drones flying around, so we will have lights and lights are going. This is a dark campus. Uh, so we hear that and we wanna move towards that. We are coming with a new camera system. Uh, we have over 1,700 cameras and now the technology is so much better. We can put one camera that can look all four ways and not have to put four cameras. We can put a camera that if we have a uh, accuser that's wearing a red shirt, uh, especially if it was an active threat, uh, what happens now is we have to go through all 1,700 cameras and try to find that person with that shirt. Well, with new technology, it'll do it for us in matters of seconds. So we know if that threat uh, came from the circle and came into the journalism building. We know if it went down to Nicholson Gateway. So that project is also on there. So yes, they are looking at that, but I think technology has so much better things right now that we need to push. But again, that, that will be up to the committee and up to the administration on which way they go. It's raining, so y'all just will ask questions because <laughs> it's too wet to go outside. Um. My question was about, just more about um, on the supporter end, like how to be a good supportive person to someone that's been affected by sexual assault, because I feel like a lot of time when people are faced with heavy information like this from someone they know, or like it's just a lot and they don't know how to respond, or they are oftentimes respond like, oh, I'm so sorry, like that sucks, like um, what can I do? But it's kind of like, people want more than that or it, like you should like or as a supportive friend like I feel like you should but it's like always like oh I'm sorry that sucks or like oh like can I like take you to this or something but it's like what are better ways to like oh how does this make you feel or like kind of deeper than just like I can take you to this or you know what uh what would y'all say are like good ways to be a good supporter to someone that's been affected by this and like what uh, events do y'all offer to like kind of um, inform people on how to support someone that's been affected by something like this? Well, obviously I, I, I have not thanked it. Oh, just topic. in general for anybody, yeah. by the way. <laughs> uh, but I will say, uh, I think, you know, I have been involved with uh, victims uh, 
throughout my career, both homicide, families of homicide victims, and sexual assaults. I work sex crimes in Baton Rouge Police Department. Uh, the number one thing is listen and don't mm -hmm. talk. Let them lead, uh, let lead the direction because everyone's individual. Everyone experiences trauma in different ways. So let them lead and say, because you can't fix it. And uh, all you can do is be a supporter for them. Um, as someone who's ran past the social media since the beginning, I've had a lot of people disclose to me over, you know, like instant messaging, like through Instagram DMs. And it's very hard to understand, you know, what they're going through. We, as in like us, all the officers in TASA, we took um, some form of training. I think it was like disclosure training mm -hmm. from STAR. And it was basically just um, one of the advisors of TASA like came in and gave us like a whole presentation on like what we should do and stuff, you know, when someone discloses for us. So I would definitely check out STAR's resources on that. Yeah, and I can chime in. I think one of the top things that we talk about when someone discloses is just how powerful it is to let them know that you believe them first and foremost and like holding that space um, and then also not providing advice because as it's been said that everyone's going to respond individually and you don't know what they're going through. So just believing them, um, not providing advice, and then also thanking them for mm -hmm. their bravery and their courage to share that with you. And then kind of checking in on like what would feel good for them. Like, would you, what is their next step? Do they want to like kind of bounce some ideas off of you? Do you, do they want you to be there when you make a call to someone? Do they need to go to the hospital? Do they want someone to come with them? Um, things like that. I, w I would add to that, um, validate their feelings whenever they do disclose and, and tell you their experience. Um, Remind them that this is not their fault. Um, I think our, our mind, I don't know if it's just the programming or societal expectations, but we tend to self-blame, like what did I do to deserve this to happen to me? We want to remind our friends that you did not do anything to deserve this, to warrant this, to welcome this. Because um, we want to kind of combat that automatic programming that we have in our brains. Um, we want to be able to be familiar with the different signs of trauma, the way they present both emotionally and behaviorally, um, because our friend might start acting differently, might be engaging in risky behavior, might be withdrawing, um, might be eating less, might be bathing less, um, might be just going a MIA, and then you just don't know where they went, right? And so to being familiar with those different types of presentations, um, will make you a better friend because it kind of gives you that red flag of, oh, I, I just need to show up and make sure that they feel supported and they're safe and um, check in on my friend. And I, I know in, in the very beginning of some traumatic event, there's a lot of support from your community. And then they kind of tend to wean off, right? Um, because it's not fresh anymore. Um, there's that expectation of, oh, you should be over this. I know a lot of student survivors have that experience. So just continue to support them in the long term, not just acutely, not in the short term. Um, and again, as Emma said, check in on them, see what, do, what, what can I do to best serve you? What can I do to support you? Can I bring you a meal? Um, can I drive you somewhere? Do you wanna go out for a little bit? Um, giving them opportunities to um, be open about their needs and, and how, how they can be supported. Because um, for some student survivors, it can be hard to, um, ask for help. So opening up that dialogue can, can be really helpful for a student survivor. Um, and of course, being familiar with the different resources available on campus is excellent because if there is a student survivor that doesn't know of all of these different resources, you can be the one to say, hey, I've, I heard about STAR, I've heard about Title IX, I, I've heard about LSUPD and, and the Lighthouse Program, and I think you should explore their services. How about I walk with you there um, so I can support you in that session, so I can hold your hand and, and, and um, be there as an advocate. Um, so those, those are some things that you could do to just um, remain a supportive friend through your friend's traumatic event. I think too that there's really not much to add. The only thing I would add is just to make sure you're taking care of yourself um, because it, it can be difficult for those who, right, if you're supporting a friend 
uh, through through this, it can be difficult for you. So just making sure you're taking care of yourself. Seek out, if you need someone to talk to, seek out resources. And then just recognizing that some of us, um, some folks, right, may have had or may have their own trauma. And so that disclosure can have different effects on them. And so I said that may be, that may need self-care for that person, whatever that looks like for that. So, I, I actually have a question. Um, yeah, we spoke about community relations, and um, I know um, the chief uh, spoke specifically about um, the police department and community relations with um, the, s the people that it, it supervises. So my thing is, I just have, you know, I'm just curious on what can we do as a whole, like everybody up here, what can we do as a whole to promote a new culture here to where victim, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, survivors are believed and heard and something is, um, you know, because I know we all read the USA article, and I think we, you know, don't want to be a part of that culture. So my question is, how do we get, um, how do we sh shift the culture here to, to make it feel like a safe haven for everybody who comes out and say says something about um, an experience that they had? How do we make sure that they are heard? How do we make sure that trust is um, established on all levels to make sure that that survivor gets everything that they need? I can start. So I think this is a, a multi-faceted approach, right? So I think, um, you know, one piece of that is uh, how can we as a community break down rape myths, break down rape culture, right? So um, how do we engage a bystander intervention when our uh, friend, you know, makes the joke, oh, that test really raped me, right? Like how do we intervene in, in those type, right? Because all of these little things and bigger things, I think, add into that culture where it's either funny or it's not a big deal, right? Then it leads. So I think everything that you've, you've heard about supporting survivors, that leads into it. I think a big part, right, is offices like mine making sure that we are following our process, that we're doing what we need to do, that, um, you know, students feel supported through the process, feel like they were heard, feel like, you know, I came to a panel and I heard Josh talk about what should happen next, and then when the report is made, that is what happened next, right? Because otherwise it's, well, they said X was gonna happen and Y was gonna happen and none of that happened. So, right, that builds into that. Um, I think, you know, s if you're part of a student org or you're a student leader, um, bring, in, bring in, you know, somebody, bring in Title IX, bring in Lighthouse, bring in STAR, bring in uh, LSUPD, bring in It's On Us and Top, bring, bring folks in to do training. Uh, make sure that student org leaders understand you know, because we're, we're, I think we're seeing more and more disclosures to write mm -hmm. student org leaders. And, and that's a lot. That's a lot mm -hmm. for, right, at 18, 19, 20, 20, whatever the age is. I mean, it's still a lot at, at 40, right? So, so that we're prepared to, to, to compassionately um, listen and understand these folks. So I think it's, there's a lot of things that we need to do as a community. And maybe the first thing we have to do is recognize this is a community issue. It is not a that person or that person. It's not a female or women identifying issue. It is a community issue. And then once we kind of say, okay, it's a community issue, then ask ourselves, well, how can I be part of the solution? And reach out to offices and say, hey, I'm not sure what I can do to, to support. And, and I think everybody on this panel will work with you to say, here are some things that, that, that you can do and we can do together. Yeah, well, you know what Josh said, it, it's, it's not just a campus problem. Uh, it's not just an LSU problem. It's a cultural. And you are the future, and you are the leaders. So enough's enough. Someone comes to you, encourage them to come forward, because that's the only way to stop it, is identifying it and let's stop it. Uh, you know, sexual assault has happened for decades, and actually the numbers uh, used to be low. Oh, it wasn't as bad back then. No, survivors weren't coming forward. Uh, so you're going to see a point where, the n unfortunately, the numbers are going to go up, uh, which only indicates uh, the survivors are encouraged to come forward, mm -hmm. and then they'll start going down. Uh, so you you can't basically look at numbers, but uh, you know I, I think he's, uh, Kevin said at the beginning how many people. Uh, either knew somebody or was involved in a sexual assault. So encourage them to come forward and, and let's put a stop to it. Uh, 
you know, whether you play sports, whether you're in a sorority or fraternity, uh, be there for that survivor, but encourage them to come forward. I just want to add, though, also that I think that there needs to be a cultural shift before survivors feel comfortable and safe coming forward, and that reporting an assault can be one of the most like re-traumatizing experiences that a survivor goes through. And so I say first and foremost, believe the survivor and hold space for whatever feels good for them, and if that's reporting, cool, and if that's not reporting, that's also cool, and encouraging those decisions. And I think that like one of the most persistent myths that we have around rape culture is that it's going to be a stranger in an alley when really it's going to be Joey in your math class who all of your friends know and like. And I think that that's a really tough issue that we face when we don't believe survivors if it doesn't look the way that we saw it on CSI. And I think that that's an important conversation to be having in, when it comes to community prevention. Uh, are there any more questions in the audience? Okay. At this time, um, I would like um, to ask the panel panelists to give their closing remarks, going in the same order from far left to right. Um, thank you for coming. <laughs> um, yeah, in the future, TASA will be continuing to hold events and try to raise awareness um, for prevention and justice for survivors on campus. We're obviously having a lot of events this month, so check out our Instagram or Twitter. Um, we're hosting a self-defense class. We're having that coffee and consent. We're having a clothing drive all month for La Fassa um, to make clothing kits for rape survivors at hospitals um, because all their clothing gets taken away for evidence. Mm -hmm. So we give them new clothes. I worked there for a bit, sorry. Um, what else do we have? We're having a dodgeball tournament to raise money for Star and La Fassa. Um, so if you and your friends want to get a team together, it's going to be fun. Um, but yeah, check out everything we do. I think what we're doing is really important. Obviously, we didn't know that USA Today, the USA Today article would come out only a few months after we started TASA, so it's been kind of a wild ride. But I'm very happy to be a part of it and honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Uh, yes, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, again, that any time uh, we can meet and discuss, whether informally or informally, uh, you know, uh, officer on a college campus is unique to any other officer uh, at a municipality or a parish or a county uh, because we can make a difference, good or bad, we can make a difference because mm -hmm. we have the time, the call volume does, yeah. gives us the time to meet with our students and faculty and staff and discuss and be a, a good partner. Uh, I can't encourage enough that day, night, anytime you feel comfortable, uncomfortable, if you're a commuter, pick up the phone and call the police. And we can be anywhere within minutes. Thank you. Yeah, just thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having uh, all of us. Uh, a couple other events. So I encourage you to check out the lsu.edu slash SAAM. Um, we've got uh, next Tuesday evening, um, I believe it's from six to seven or six to eight in the, and I'm gonna pronounce this wrong because this is one of those Louisiana things. It's either achafalaya, achafalaya. I've heard it so many different ways. Achafalaya. The second one, achafalaya, thank you. So in the achafalaya room in the union, uh, we have um, Reclaiming Space, uh, um, Trauma-Informed Yoga, actually STARS, uh, Trauma-Informed Yoga instructor is, is partnering with us to do that. That's a series we wanna bring back to bring to campus next year on a monthly basis. The purpose being um, to create community for survivors. And also I think survivors um, not, sometimes feel a disconnect from campus. Um, and so we wanna, tr we, we're hoping that that series helps them kind of reclaim their space on campus and feel reconnected. I said next Thursday we have Queer and Consent 
Uh, Tuesdays are Teal Tuesdays. It's a very small step, but wearing teal to show survivors that you believe them and you support them. Uh, Wednesday, April 27th is Denim Day. Um, so I think you're gonna see TASA, Feminist in Action, uh, Title IX, uh, a lot of organizations out tabling that day. Um, and then if you have questions, reach out to our office. Um, if you wanna partner on events, please reach out to us, I think, or any, any of the folks on the panel. Um, and if you wanna get involved, the other thing I'll say is next year, I don't know when, but next year, the Board of Regents is gonna be releasing uh, uh, the first uh, climate survey. Um, and so please, 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 I don't know how long it's gonna be. I know students and employees are asked to do this survey and that survey and this survey, and you, you, you get just tired of it but it's such an important survey um, to hear student voices. Um, so please, when you get that email, I know you're just gonna wanna hit delete. You may not be in the mood right then, but, but don't delete it. Take a second, find space in your calendar if you can, and take that climate survey so that we can hear the voice of the campus as a collective. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the conversations that we had today, and um, you can find more information about STAR at our Instagram, which is Star Advocates, and our website is star.ngo. We have um, a lot of volunteer opportunities as well as community outreach events, and if you or someone you know is interested in services, the best way to reach us is our hotline. Thank you everyone for joining this panel and Jalicia for inviting Lighthouse and arranging this with Cameron. I really appreciate um, bringing the community together in this way for Sexual Awareness um, Month, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, if you know of anyone or yourself who would like, you would like to meet with the Lighthouse program, you are welcome to uh, call us to our front desk or try to set an appointment online on our website, which is lsu.edu slash lighthouse. Um, we do have some brochures, stickers, um, and contact information in the back by the refreshments. I know Star placed some information back there too, so you are welcome to take as many stickers and, and pins as you'd like. Um, and thank you again. I hope you leave here today feeling more informed and more prepared um, and able to support your student survivor friends. Thank you. Can we all give a round of applause for this family? In closing, everyone's support makes a difference. How you respond to a survivor can posit positively impact their healing process. Trauma is often, often shrouded, shrouded in secrecy and denial. Many sexual assault survivors are afraid to come forward for fear of not being believed or being blamed for what happened to them. No one should overpower you. There should, there should be, never be a time that you fear for your safety. This panel has reminded us that we all have a responsibility to prevent these crimes and support the victims, not only to live, not only to live our core values, but also to ensure our future generation of tigers that this is a safe place to be. I hope we gave everyone here and tuning in um, via YouTube some great resources to use. I would um, like to give a special thanks to our panelists who fight hard every day to ensure safety on this campus. You are appreciated. I would like to also thank everyone who came out and tuned into the event. I hope you all have a great night and thank you. Stay dry. <laughs> oh, also, there's refreshments in the back. Yeah. So you guys eat that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, sir. How you doing, sir? Yes, sir. That was great. I'm a big fan of your t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you.